place I'd rather be. There's no place I'd rather be, no, no place I'd rather be, God. No place I'd rather be than here in your love, oh, here in your love, oh, God. No place I'd rather be. There's no place I'd rather be, no, no place I'd rather be than here in your love, here in your love, oh, God. No place I'd rather be. There's no place I'd rather be, Lord. No place I'd rather be than here in your love, here in your love, oh God. There's no place I'd rather be. There's no place I'd rather be, no. No place I'd rather be than here in your love, here in your love, oh God. Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. So set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. No place. There's no place I'd rather be, no. No place I'd rather be, God. No place I'd rather be than here in your love, here in your love, oh God. No place I'd rather be. There's no place I'd rather be, no. No place I'd rather be than here in your love, here in your love, oh God. So set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. So set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. More of you, God. I want more. 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 Won't you pour it out? I want more, 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 I want more. Won't you pour it out? There's no place I'd rather be, no, no place I'd rather be. There's no place I'd rather be than here in your love, here in your love, oh God. No place I'd rather be. There's no place I'd rather be, God. No place I'd rather be than here in your love, here in your love, oh God. I'm here in your love. I'm here in your love, oh God. So set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. To set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. I want more. I want more. I want more. I want more. I want more, I want more, I want more, I want more, I want more. There is no limit to your power. There is no stopping what you plan You give us faith to move a mountain And hope to dream again We see the fires of revival The darkness giving way to light the glory of your grace advancing Let it burn up the night Let it burn up the night Let the walls come down 
In Jesus' name, let the lost be found. In Jesus' name, let the church arise to shine your light to the world. Your house forever undivided. All your sons and daughters one. At the cross we are united. Our hope is in your blood. Our hope is in the blood. Let the walls come down. In Jesus' name, let the lost be found. In Jesus' name, let the church arise to shine your light to the world. Open eyes. Open eyes to see. In Jesus' name, let the city sing. In Jesus' name, let the church arise to shine your light to the world. Salvation's tide is rising as all your people seek your face. Your life a river flowing to wash our sin and shame away. Salvation's tide is rising as all your people seek your face. Your life a river flowing to wash our sin and shame away. Salvation's tide is rising as all your people seek your face. Your life a river flowing to wash our sins. See it again. Shame away. Salvation's tide is rising as all your people seek your face. Your life a river flowing to wash our sin and shame away. name let the lost be found in jesus name let the church arise shine your light to the world open eyes to see in jesus name let the city sing in jesus name let the church arise shine your light to the world Salvation's tide is rising as all your people seek your face. Your life forever flowing to wash our sin and shame away. You're the author of all things. You're the anchor holding strong no matter what this life may bring. You're the father never changing. You're the river running deep. And oh what joy it is to know that Father is for me. Your love is matchless. Nothing can come close. Your love is matchless. Father, you love us the most. Oh, you do. Oh, you love us the most. Oh, you love us the most. You're the hope of all nations. You're the hope of all nations. 
You're the King who has saved us. You're the light in the darkness, shining out bright for me, bright for me. You're the hope of all nations. You're the King who has saved us. You're the light in the darkness, shining out bright for me, bright for me. Your love is matchless. Nothing can come close. Your love is matchless, Father. You love us the most. Your love brings victory. Your love brings victory. Your love conquers death. Your love brings victory for me, Father. So none can stand, none can stand against. None can stand against your love. None can stand against your love. Death can't hold us any longer. Your love, your love is stronger. Your name is matchless. Your love is matchless. Nothing can come close. Your love is matchless, Father. You love us the most Your love brings victory Your love conquers death Your love brings victory for me, Father So none can stand Fear can't hold us any Death can't hold us any longer. Your love, your love is stronger. Yes, it is. Fear can't hold us any longer. Death can't hold us any longer. Your Your love, your love, your love is stronger, your love, your love, your love is stronger, your love, your love, your love is stronger. comes in here. Will y'all please help me um, pray over her? The Lord just did something to my heart, um, and uh, I need to I need to be obedient to it. Mikey, you can keep going until she comes back in, okay? Sad. 
as the final word Sorrow may put a darkest night The cross as the final word thank you that you give us visions you give us dreams but father you give us the prophetic insight to the wonders of who you are to be able to truly set the captives free father god i thank you that you will use the most unlikely vessels father god it doesn't even matter if you're willing or not it's whoever you choose so father i just i thank you that you give her dreams prophetic dreams to sound the alarm to the nations or to either bring comfort to them father i thank you that you give her a tongue that will rightly divide the word and that as she releases these words that it will divide truth from the lie father god i thank you for the beauty that she beholds but also for the beauty that she also speaks life over father i thank you that this woman is one that will see treasure inside of people because it's super easy to see the dirt but it takes work to see the treasure so father i thank you that she will look inside the hearts of your sons and daughters and that she will speak your living word and pour over your balm, pour over your oil, that she will break her box over whoever it is that you have called her to weep and mourn over. Not because she's broken, but she, because she knows that broken people cannot make it without you. Because Father, she's walked the walk. She knows what it's like to be marked. She knows what it's like to be ridiculed. She knows what it's like to be shunned. But Father, she also knows what it's like to come out of the fire and not be alone. Father, I ask that you bless her. That you bless her hands. This is a woman that will build her family for generations to come. It's not just the four that she's given birth to, but it's the many that you've called her to be a mother to. Father, I pray that when she speaks, that she speaks in confidence and boldness. No man can stop her. Let the glory of the Lord be with her, go before her, and be behind her all the days of her life. mighty, 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 powerful woman of God. You walk in such grace and peace and the enemy tries to steal that peace, but it is so ingrained in you. It is the only peace that God can give and you carry that with you all the time and you share that you share that in words of encouragement and words of wisdom you are a mighty woman of God when 
mess of the things the Lord is going to give you. It's going to be in the pit of your belly. <laughs> You're going to have no choice but to release it. You have to release it, okay? And she talks about you being the mother of many. You have to know that you you have a mother that was a mother of many. And just because you're a daughter-in-law doesn't make you any different. You're a daughter. And you are going to be a mother of many. So you're carrying on the legacy. The same as Lauren carries it on, you will carry it on as well. It's not any different. It's not weaker with you and stronger with her. It's the same. I wasn't going to share what God was giving me. In fact, I picked up the microphone before Lorena came and got it for me. But he was telling me that the the, the name Mary, which God used uh, so many times in the Bible, uh, actually means rebellious. And I know that we're praying over Vanessa right now. And I'm not using her as an example of somebody rebellious, but it's everybody, whether you're male or female. Uh, God uses us, and oftentimes in our rebellion is when He can birth something that miraculous, or He, or, or the, and no matter how many times people try to put labels on these Marys in the Bible, whether they be a prostitute or whether you know she was a virgin, or you know all these things, they, they were known by the pursuit, they were known by their intimacy with God. These these women. God used in a miraculous way. So I pray that all these girls would stay up here just for a minute and that we would actually receive that right now, that, that in our rebellion, in our state we're in right now, that God uses us in a mighty way to birth something into this kingdom, that we just receive it. Even if we don't understand it, just know, hey, that's me. I want to I want to, to be known not by what the world gives me a, a label for, but I want to be known by my pursuit for you, my willingness to pour it all out on you. And I pray right now that you just come and receive that, just get an impartation from these. It's not a not a mistake that there was a women's uh, uh, conference this weekend in, and we're talking about this right now that Mary is on our heart rebellion is on our heart father and that we we truly want to break that rebellion and we want to be known by our pursuit so come up here have these women lay hands on you while Michael continues with us worship and uh, just receive the fullness of what God has for you today he wants to use you no matter what your condition is there isn't a, 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 a the harlot or the prostitute there's just beloved you're his beloved you're known not by all these other names of the world you're known as by him as my love my beloved amen So it's funny that Crystal just prayed over of being a daughter because as I was getting dressed this morning, I had to look in the mirror and I had to con convince myself and tell myself, you're a daughter. It has been prophesied over you and you have to remind yourself, you are a daughter of the Most High God. So it doesn't matter where you are, if you're in Gatesville or if you're in Temple, you are to be activated as a daughter. Once you said yes to me, you became my daughter. You were able to lay hands, you were able to pray, and you were able to speak because you belong to me. And it doesn't matter in which area you are in, which area you feel comfortable in. It's the most uncomfortable places that you can go and you can speak because I said you can because I live inside of you. Beloveds and he is my heart, so come into your 
your garden and take delight in me. Take delight in me. Cause I am my beloved's and he is my hand. So come into your garden and take delight in me. Take delight in me.
Life is not my own To you I belong I give myself I give myself to you Sing that out My life is not my own To you I belong I give myself I give myself to you is not my own to you I belong I give myself I give myself to you I give myself away I give myself away so you can use me I give myself away Every chain, break every chain. There's an army. 
there's an army rising up. There's an army rising up. There's an army rising up to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain, to break every chain. Break every chain, break every chain, oh. to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain, to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. As I was singing this song uh, and I was looking at Break Every Chain, I kept thinking of, uh, it actually almost mirrored a word that I gave my daughter. I told my daughter that there were some, you know, like blocks built up around her. It almost, in appearance, it looked like, like what a fireplace would be made out of. But it was really like just this fake fireplace that was really up around her. And I turned around and I looked at that and I was like, break every chain. I heard the Lord say that the chain that, that is trying to bind you is so breakable. It is so breakable by one drop of his blood. Just one. But if you'll let him overtake and overcome all of it, it will dissolve it, that there will not even be a memory of it. That he has called you into greater things, that you are not to live a life of settlement. Jesus, mighty God. You are not allowed to live a life of just settling. You are not allowed to live a life of just saying, I'm going to make it just one day at a time you get to walk through life with happiness and joy and thanksgiving everything that the word says that we can have you can have it because he wants you to have it you don't get to determine your day based on anybody else's compass but his when you wake up and you put your foot on the ground you get to know that today is a day that the Lord has made for you not for everybody else around you for you and at that moment, that is when the earth starts shaking around you. And all of this other turmoil stuff that goes on around you, you let God take care of it. But you get up and you do your part and you come. Peter could have stayed in the boat. Peter was so, he was so distraught over denying Jesus that he could have stayed in the boat and said, you know what? No, I failed you. But as soon as he caught a glimpse of him, he went after him. You have to do the same thing. He says, get up and make your way. Come. The closer you come, the more empowered you get, and the more these things have to flee from you. Don't you be upset about the things that go away from you. Because I'm telling you, the closer to Him you get, the less you'll worry about that stuff. Okay? Father, I ask that you bless her. Father, I ask that you truly give her eyes to see and ears to hear. Father God, I ask that you strengthen this woman's heart. Lord, I ask you strengthen this woman's back. Because, Father God, the weight has been almost unbearable. But, Lord, I thank you. You have not called her to walk crooked. You have called her to walk straight with her head held high. So, Lord, there is nothing that is too big for you. Father, I ask that you just continue to just speak to her. Father God, that she'll be conscious of, of the things that she listens to, the words that people speak, and the things that even come out of her own mouth. Father, I pray that you will just guard her and protect her and strengthen her. She is a woman to be reckoned with. Lord, I ask that you just give it all. Because she'll give it all right back. Bless her, Jesus. Amen. Come thou found of every blessing to now to sing thy grace. 
streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise teach me some melodious song sung by flaming tongues above praise the mount I'm fixed upon it mount of God's redeeming love oh to grace and oh to grace how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee i'm prone to wander lord i feel it i'm prone to leave the god i love oh here's my heart lord take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Of loudest praise, of loudest praise, we sing you songs of loudest praise. in a mighty way, Lord, and you're going to do great and mighty things this day, Father. We trust you, and we know, Lord, that nothing is impossible with you, Father. So we give it to you, Father. Say, have your way this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Y'all give Michael a hand. I saw this guy there in prayer. He was sneezing and blowing his nose and coughing, and he still, with, without fear, stood up here and led us into praise and worship. Amen. Amen. I thought we were going to have to do CDs, but we, he, he pushed through. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. I took uh, Joseph whenever I was in temple a couple Wednesdays ago. I brought Joseph up here and I sat him down and, and uh, I said, tell everybody to be quiet because fi church is fixing to start. And I gave him the microphone. He says, hey, Big Josh, just wait for me. I'll be right there. <laughs> he didn't listen. He just wants this Big Josh. All right, well, I got the wonderful pleasure of introducing today's guest speaker. Um, Y'all might know him. He's my offspring, my son, my seed. Y'all give a hand for Andrew Payne. Good morning. It is a, this is a good church. This is a good church. I liked it that we couldn't get through one song without somebody getting prayed for. That's a, that's a good sign of a healthy church. Um, so, I got to listen finally to Mikey's message. Uh, I know he did one here about, the, uh, about Elijah. And then he did one in Temple about Elijah. And I finally got to listen to it. And whenever I found out that I was going to preach here, my mom said, Hey, Andrew, you should preach your Elijah message. And I was like, No, nah, I don't want to do that. I don't, that's not, I don't want to do that. Like, y'all already heard it. 
So I was really trying to force myself into like preaching something different. I'm like, we're going to go in the promised land. Maybe like a promised land message. What do you think of that, God? And he's like, no, I think you should do the Elijah message. I'm like, all right, well, hold on. I said, let's look at the New Testament. Because I never preach out of the New Testament. I said, let's look at the New Testament. Let's preach some Jesus stuff. Everybody wants to hear Jesus, right? He goes, no, I think you should do the Elijah message. So I was like, but they already heard it. And he's like, we'll do a sequel. You already seen Rocky. Let's watch Rocky 2. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to do uh, Elijah uh, 2.0. Okay, we're going to go a, a little bit further, a little bit deeper with Elijah, and I feel that it's going to be, um, that everybody's going to get something out of this today. Um, and I know this, is, this, this may sound, this may sound wrong, but as a son, my God has given me the right to say that you're going to get something out of this. That I, I, have, I have an open account to him. I have his, his card, and then I'm going to start swiping some people's lives because I feel that there's something that we can impart and partake in, that there's something here for all of us. And I, it's, it's bold, but I cannot talk about Elijah without speaking about being bold. So if we can, uh, let's go to Revelations chapter 3, uh, verse 15 and 16. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish that you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. The scripture scares the mess out of me. This is in Revelation, so I'm like, this is the, uh, whenever I first started going to church, I didn't want to know what happened. I want to know what's going to happen. So you come across stuff in Revelations and you're like, is this me? Like, is this what's going to happen? And it scared me because I thought of myself as a, uh, I never wanted to be a lukewarm believer. But now that I've been a, a believer for some time now, it, that, that's all of us at some point. We become lukewarm. We become um, stagnant. And after I was doing some research, I found out that there's this, there was this, uh, this, this village that they're actually talking to, Jesus is talking to them, uh, and what they would do is they had these, these old Roman pipes, and they were wooden pipes, and what they would do is they would, get the, uh, they would get this hot water from the spring, and they wanted to do all kinds of stuff with it. You want to wash your clothes, you want to cook your food, cook it with, with, with hot water. And what's happened is that because it would travel for so long, by the time they get there, it become lukewarm. It's like a soda that's been left out a day. You ain't going to drink that. And then if they wanted cold water, they would take it from the mountain, same pipes, and they would come down. And by the time I got there, it wasn't cold either. Still don't want to drink that. So I worried about this becoming our Christian walk. And I, I didn't want that to happen for me. But it does. It does happen to everybody. It happens to us at some point in our ministry where we begin to become lukewarm. And how do we recover from this? Well, we're going to look at Elijah. Elijah is a perfect example of a person that went from being hot. He was so hot, he was calling fire down from heaven. This is how hot you are. I don't know if any of y'all called fire down from heaven. I haven't. So maybe I'm not hot enough. But the man had enough relationship with God to where he had the same right, the same right that I have of telling you that you're going to get something out of this. He had the same right to call fire down from heaven to beat the prophets of Baal. He was able to win battles and so are you. Being on fire for God changes your environment. Elijah had the benefit and the experience of calling fire from heaven to change his environment. He called the fire down to win a battle against the worshipers of Baal, trying to restore the king of Israel. He was trying to restore Ahab. Ahab was a bad, a bad king. It said that his dad was bad, but Ahab was worse. That's a bad kid. That's a rotten apple. And we've come across, like I work for the, the bus department, I come across some bad apples. <laughs> and there's a lot of times that you want to tear them down. I don't know how, how old Ahab was at this point, 
you obviously know that he has a, uh, he's in a bad, a bad marriage. He's in a marriage with Jezebel. At some point, uh, some of us either become Jezebel or are married to Jezebel. And that, that defeats a lot of us. It defeats a lot of us because that's at home. And what Elijah was doing, he was trying to restore Ahab. You are the king of Israel. You are the king of the promised land. And I want to restore you. Look what you're doing. I call down fire. This is the God that you're worshiping. My God is living, and your God is dead. So as he tries to restore the king of Israel, he tries to respect him. Tells him, this is what's going to happen. Matter of fact, after they leave, Elijah runs in front of him. As all good Christians and followers should do, is run ahead of your leadership. You're going to fight the way for them. We're going to go forth in our nation, and we're going to do something great. Elijah says he picked up his robe, he ran in front of the chariot. He's actually outrunning the chariot. He was a fast guy. Now the king, even though he was a bad king, was still the king, but he's in a position of authority. Elijah came to turn things around, but he couldn't change Ahab's environment. Of course, whenever Ahab went back, he probably told Jezebel about Elijah and God's fire. I came back and gave a good testimony. Guess what I heard, honey, this Sunday? And it changed my life. Or did it? As soon as Jezebel heard this, obviously she's not going to be mad. She just had 700 people, 700 of her in position prophets just got killed. She's not happy. She's not in a good mood. Instead of being inspired, she was mad, and she made a vow, by this time tomorrow, if Elijah is not dead, then the gods do the same to me as they did to them. Well, you know that her vow was empty because her gods were empty, with the promise that she knew nothing of the fullness of the living God. She's over there promising on a God that can't keep his promises. And she's going to battle against the God who answered him immediately. Matter of fact, whenever they're, they're actually doing this battle, I, I really enjoyed Elijah because Elijah was the first trash talker in the Bible. He, it was really nice because these guys are all dancing around and they're you know, hooping and hollering and they're cutting themselves because they're trying to get their God's attention. And he even tells them, he goes, hey, maybe your God's sleeping or he's sitting on the toilet. I was like, this is the start. This is the start of trash talking. <laughs> you won't see it in the history books, but there is a start of it. But her empty threats still affected Elijah, and he fled. Jacked me up. Jacked me up. But man, just out of the biggest battle of his life, fled from an empty threat. Somebody coming in your house, threaten you with a gun, and they don't even have one. A man on fire experiences the fire of God, runs. Discouraged, he pleads for death. He was hit with depression, and he felt alone against the world. The world will never change a king that will never change. The only thing that can change was his walk and his heart. That was the only thing that changed from this experience. Now, it really bothered me that I found out that Elijah wanted to die. I was like, what, what Christian, what on fire Christian would plead for his own death? Actually ask God, send a prayer up to heaven for his own death. And then I, I researched it and I was like, there was seven other people that wished that, that they could die in the Bible. Job? I mean, Job went through some bad stuff. Moses, Solomon, Elijah, Jeremiah, Jonah, and Paul all wished for their own death. And that jacked me up. But also let me know that there's some humility in the Bible. Because as much as uh, I know that a lot of people like to tear down the Bible and they, they, they find some fault in here. What I like about the Bible is that the Bible tells you the whole story. I'm not just going to tell you the good stuff. I'm going to tell you the bad stuff. My, my prophet was on fire. He went through a bad time. Why? He went lukewarm. Lukewarm, just the same as all of us get lukewarm. And how does he recover from it? Well, Mikey talked about uh, 
about the ravens coming to, to feed him. That he was, he was, there was, there was spring from the brook and he's drinking the spring water. Ravens are feeding him, giving him some manna from heaven. Some old, some old, old testament. Even for Elijah, this old testament stuff in there. He's getting manna from them. But was it enough? Angel comes down to him and says, get up. You got to eat. You got a long journey ahead of you. He gets up and he eats. Goes laid back down. Same as I want to do on Sunday morning. Angel comes back in and says, hey, you got to get up. You got to go. You got a long journey ahead of you. So he gets up. If we can, let's go to 1 Kings chapter 19. We're going to read from uh, verse 8 all the way through to 21. I might read, I might paraphrase here. I'm better at storytelling than I am reading. So he, uh, so he arose, he ate and drank. He went in the strength of the food for 40 days and 40 nights as far as Horeb, the mountain of God, also known as Mount Sinai, right? This is, uh, this is this place where Moses has, has had an encounter with God. And any time that you see a mountain in the Bible, understand that that's God's presence. This man wants to seek God's presence. Thing is, is there was no instruction said that he needed to go there. Some of us take some liberties with our ministry. We like to go places we know we ain't supposed to go. We like to see things we ain't supposed to see, and we like to hear things we ain't supposed to hear. Even if they're right. All right, that's a good thing, right? God tells you to go out, venture into the world. I need you to go and speak a message. Let me go to church first. I need to hear that. So he goes there. Then he went into a cave, spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. He said, what are you doing here, Elijah? So he said, I've been very zealous for you, Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken you. Your covenant tore down your altars. I killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left. They seek to take my life. Oh. Then he said, get out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. Now, like I said, Elijah was searching for some Old Testament stuff. Moses, whenever he was traveling, was called into a cave to seek the, promise, the presence of God. To experience God for the first time. Now, Elijah went to go do some Old Testament stuff. He's like, nah, no God hangs out in the cave. Let me go experience him. He's not there. Instead, Elijah gets called out. This speaks to me because it lets me know that what may work for somebody is not going to work for you. Just because God was here for somebody doesn't mean that he's going to be there for you. It's not to say that God isn't everywhere. It's to say that you're called somewhere differently than they're called. Moses was called out. Elijah's already there. He said, Elijah, you've got to get out. You've got to stand before the mountain and behold, the Lord passed by. A great, strong wind tore into the mountains, broke the rocks. I've never seen a wind that, that strong. I've seen some to, we've lived in a mobile home and they'll shake that, but uh, never to tear the rocks of the mountain. Uh, in pieces before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. Thought he was showing up. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. After the fire, a still, small voice. But then God came into the church and it wasn't a message. But then God came into the church and it wasn't the goosebumps. Oh, but God came into the message and it wasn't the prayer that I got. Where was God? Still, small voice within you. You, this whole time you're waiting on God to show up and you forgot that he's with you. So when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle, went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Suddenly a voice came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah, why has your ministry turned into this? What are you doing with your ministry? 
I've given you a gift of words. I've given you a gift of music. I've given you a gift of just connecting with people. Why are you back in church still wanting to see me instead of reaching my people? Oh, that's not what he said. He asked him, why are you here? Why are we here today? Are we here to seek the presence of God? Are we here to get affirmed so we can get back to orders? Elijah shows some disobedience, goes to Mount Horeb, and God asks him, why are you here? How did you get to this place in your ministry? Why are you hiding in the church and not out there doing what you're called for? And that hurt me to hear that. Because I don't want to hear that. God shows himself, but he does it in a way that shows him that it's not in the power of God. It's in his perspective. He humbles Elijah. Whenever Elijah covers himself with his mantle, he's shown the respect that God deserves. At some point, we do walk with that authority of that, I, I can ask God for this. I can ask God for this. This is my daddy. And I forget that he's my living God. It's not for me to be arrogant. I do have a, a knowledge that I know that whenever I pray for somebody, that I know that God's going to listen to them. It doesn't mean that I get to go out and wish for whatever. He's not a wishing well. And I'm not going to treat him like that. He's, he is the living God. He's not just any God. It's different. So, covers his face. Just as he told Moses, told Moses, ain't nobody going to look at me. Nobody's going to look at me. Why? Because you'll worship the image of me, and he won't worship me. Care about what I look like. So he covers him. Covers him with his mantle. So, God gives him some instruction. Oh, after, after this. Go ahead. He goes ahead and gives him the same answer, but he gives it to him a little bit more humbly. Then the Lord said to him, Go and return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. That's where you're supposed to go in the first place. And when you arrive, anoint Hazel as king over Syria. Also, you shall anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. Oh, did I say Israel? I meant Syria. I'm sorry. Um, and Elisha, the son of Shephet, of Abel Manola, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. Now Elijah, doing these great things, went to God, got some confirmation, got some repentance, and now he found out he's replaced? What? It shall be whoever escapes the sword of Hazel and Jehu will kill. And whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bow, bowed to bow, and, whoever, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Just to let you know that even though you are called, you are set out, and you feel like you're the only one. God can use somebody else. And he has to let Elijah know this. You gotta humble him a little bit. You're not the only one out there. But you're my special one. I called you in particular. And if you're married, you understand this. You understand this as a husband, as a wife, that there's millions, billions of people out there. But you pick one. You pick one to do something special with, to build a family with, to build a life with, a career, to experience love with. You make them special. You let them know that they're not the only one. You're special. You're my special one. That's what Elijah is. Elijah is so popular that they even thought that John and Jesus were Elijah coming back. But after I read this, I was like, Elijah couldn't have been that popular, right? So it says that, uh, it says that uh, Elijah went out, departed from there, found Elisha, the son of Shephet, 
who was plowing with twelve yokes of oxen before him. And he was with the twelfth. When Elijah passed by him, he threw his mantle on him. When it says through there, it is shalak, or pronounced shalak. It means to cast, hurl, or fling. <laughs> so he went, it's walking by him. I'm going to give you a visual demonstration here because that's what I do. So he's walking by him, and this is his mantle. He's just cruising along and. <laughs> Cheers! See what comes with it. You got. You got the mantle of God. It's your problem now. This man is his heart. His heart's messed up, right? You've been in church long enough. You've been speaking into people's life, and you feel like you're not making any progress. It's discouraging. You just wish that you had one. I just prayed for a, a king. I just prayed for a, a pastor. I just prayed for a, a leadership. I prayed for my boss. I was hoping that he would stop being a jerk at work. But he went back. He went back to, to Jezebel. What is my purpose here? So I'm giving up. I'm casting off my mantle. God says it's going to somebody else. Oh, but what does Elisha do? And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Please let me kiss my father and mother, and then I will follow you. He said to him, Go back again, for what have I done for you? So Elisha turned back from him, took a yoke of oxen, and slaughtered them, boiled their flesh, using the oxen's equipment, and gave it to the people, and they ate. And he arose and followed Elisha and became his servant. I ask the question to you, can one red-hot, on-fire Christian change the environment? We experienced it with Elijah, that he changed the environment. He called down and he won a battle. He got discouraged. He got depressed. We've been there. But what about Elijah's heart? Does that matter? Yes, it matters. Elijah wanted to touch somebody's life, and he thought he was going to do it with a king, and said he was going to do much better than that. Elijah wound up going out, and he touched a nation. He touched two kings, and he touched another prophet. This prophet's enthusiasm that I'm going to follow after God inspires him, makes him get back in it, gives him back his mantle. This is yours. I, don't, I haven't deserved it yet. So he gives him back his mantle. This mantle winds up being a big thing because later on the same mantle is uh, uh, part in rivers. He, he gets out. But I thought it was real funny because, uh, you know, there's a story in Luke. If, if we can, let's go to it. There's a story in Luke where Jesus is, uh, Jesus is needing some followers, right? I'm going to go to Luke uh, chapter 9, verse 59. Then he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus gave the most unchristian response in the world. He said, Jesus, Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go out and preach the kingdom of God. What I thought was really horrible about this, because I was like, man, that is, Jesus is like pretty mean. Why would you want to follow him? What I found out, though, is this guy's father wasn't dead yet. His, his, he was like, please, my, my dad... Let me just spend some time with him. And then I'll do it. It wasn't like he was dead and he's at, at home and he's thinking up the place. Let me at least get that out. It was, he's still alive. So then another said, Lord, I will follow you, but first let me go and bid, bid them farewell who are all at my house. Jesus said to him, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. So I thought about this. Elisha out there plowing the field, working, gets some mantle tossed at him. And he runs over there. 
to Elijah, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to go tell my mom and dad goodbye, and I'm going to get rid of my past. I'm not turning back. Anyone who puts a shoulder to the plow and looks back isn't fit. So that's why he went and got rid of the past. He went and made sure that there ain't no way I can turn back. I am solely devoted for this. It's like having one of those jobs that you got to move for. And you, you can't go back. You have to succeed here. I've given myself no other option. I've gone into a marriage and I don't keep up with my ex-girlfriend. I can't go back. Or I, I got a job, but I, I'm, I'm still, I'm not going to burn any bridges over here just in case I get fired because I really want to set this career, but I need a backup plan. No. My shoulder is to the plow and I'm going to succeed here. It doesn't mean I get to cuss out my boss so I can go back to my other boss. I have to be here. It stuck with me because I had to understand what the difference was. He took the, the oxen, he burnt Burn it, burnt the yoke. He fed all the people. He left the place better than where he left it. Like, it made it, he made it better. And that's how you can tell when a red hot Christian has been there. It doesn't get worse. We don't tear up our ministry, we build it. The next person, whoever was going to take that 12th spot of that, that oxen, is going to be in a good spot. One, they're going to have some new oxen, they're going to have some new equipment, and they're fed. That's perfect. But Elijah wasn't a... I don't want y'all to look at Elijah as, as this person who wasn't really changing the environment. So I don't want you to think that he was just this person that uh, just changed, uh, just won a battle. So if we can, we're going to go to 1 Kings 17. Um, we're going to read, I think it's 1717, right? Now it happened after these things that the son of the woman who owned the house became sick. Elijah at this time is actually, he's staying with this, this woman. This is actually, he's getting built up into a prophet. He's, he's being changed. He's, he's on fire for God. And the woman's son becomes sick. His sickness was so serious that there was no breath in him. She said to Elijah, What have I to do with you, O man of God? You come to me, bring my sin into remembrance, and kill my son. And he said to her, Give me your son. So he took him out of her arms, carried him to the upper room where he was staying, and laid him out on his own bed. Then he cried out to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, my God, have you also brought tragedy on the widow with whom I lodge by killing her son? And he stretched himself out of the child three times, cried out to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, my God, I pray, let this child's soul come back to him. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah and the soul of the child came back to him and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper room of the house and gave him to his mother. Elijah said, see, your son lives. Can a red-hot Christian change their environment? Absolutely. Sickness has no place where a red-hot Christian is. Death has no place where a, hot, where a hot Christian is. Idols have no place where a hot Christian lives. Defeat has no place where a hot Christian lives. Old school style doesn't even have a place where hot Christians live. That jacks me up because I like old school. I was one of those kids like I was listening to music uh, a couple years past my time. Right, like 20 years. Like I was, I'm supposed to be listening to the 2000 music and I'm listening to 80s music. It's just me. I like that. Um, but a, a lot of things happen in the Bible that are old school, and it, we need it to be new school. We need a new covenant. Elijah's trying to go back to, uh, to what Moses is doing. It's not working. Come to where God is calling you. Can a red-hot Christian change the environment? Let's go to uh, Numbers chapter 14. It'll be the last time I make y'all 
travel in y'all's Bible. I normally try to get this all down in one area. Uh, chapter 14, verse 1. So here we are, about to get into the promised land. This is what I really wanted to preach, preach about. I wanted to preach about going into the promised land and how to prepare. That's what our prophets have been saying in our church, is saying that we're going into the promised land. We're going to do something. We're going to do something great. But why does it suck so bad? Why does it seem so gloomy? Look, it says in Revelations that a, a, a red, red hot Christian, hot or cold, don't be lukewarm. My, I was raised up, and because there's kids in here, I'll say it right, but my dad says, if you're going to do something, don't do it half-butted. Do it all the way. If you're going to walk this walk, do it all the way. Don't give me a half-butted effort. God says the same thing. Little did I know, that this was BC, before my, my dad discovered Christ. He's telling me some godly wisdom. Don't do it halfway. Make this walk all the way. Or don't do it at all. Stay inside, I'll do it. If you want it done right, do it yourself. That's another saying. That's not a godly saying. God says, I put you there, and you're going to do it all the way. So over here in Numbers, so all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried. The people wept that night. And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them, If we had died in the land of Egypt, or only if we had died in the wilderness, why has our Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and children should become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? Would it not be better for us to put our shoulder to the plow and go back? Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before the assembly of the congregation and the children of Israel. Let's do it old school, right? That works. Now, but Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of uh, Jephune, were among those who had spied out the land and tore their clothes. They let him know that before I was a Christian, I was a believer. I had an experience with God. I didn't get jaded by the church. Tore it off. And let him know. Just because I'm a Christian doesn't mean I'm not a man. And when a man, and I, I mean this for women too, whenever you see a threat and you see something trying to get into your house, you don't move. You fight. That's what we do. We fight. There's nothing that's going to come in your house in the middle of the night and kick you out. You're not going to let it happen. And you're not going to let people talk like that around you. That's not what a red-hot Christian does. And they spoke to all the congregation of the ch children of Israel, saying, The land we pass through and spied out is a, an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, he will bring us to the land and give it to us, the land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land. For they are our bread... Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Can a red-hot Christian change their environment? Yes, they can. If I go and I take a boiling pot of water, and I drop it into the bathtub, is it hot? What about if I take a boiling pot of water, and I go and I put it in the lake? Is it hot? No. No. Why? Your environment. Our environment makes us. It sucks. Because I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear that I can't hang around certain people. Or do certain things. I'm missing out on stuff. But a red hot Christian can change your environment, right? Absolutely. As much as I want to believe that the red hot Christian can change their environment, I also have to realize that you can't put yourself in an environment where you won't become red hot. If you want to be on fire for God, you got to put yourself by the fire. If you want to be cold, stay over there by the lake. 
it's, it's not going to change. It might dry up, but it's not going to change. The temperature is going to remain until you get hot enough to where you make the change. For some reason, if you were to go jump in to the lake right now, it would be freezing. It would be cold, your muscles would get jolted, and you would change. But if you leave that lake over there long enough to experience the sun, the temperature will change. It may not become red hot, but it does change the environment. The red hot Christian doesn't do it, it's God that does it. That's what Elijah forgot. It's the red hotness of the Christian, not because he is on fire, but because God through him makes him on fire. As they're going into the promised land and as you go into your promised land, remember that it's not you that is on fire, but it's God that works through you that's on fire. It's not the enemy that has a protection, it's you that has a protection. And there's nothing that you cannot do through God. You will beat any giant that stands before you. You will eat him as bread. You will devour your enemy through God. And it's important for us to remember it. If you are discouraged on your walk, in your ministry, I encourage you, get on fire for God. Even through Elijah's disobedience, God accommodated him. And God will accommodate you. God will strengthen you. Give you words give you food, give you nourishment. We will build you up and we will take you out into the world to where you can be a stronger, more impactful believer. God has not called us to be a Christian. He's called us to be an on fire believer, an on fire disciple. It was 12 people that chose to follow him. They didn't have to go back and bury the dead. They didn't go back and had, had, they didn't want to live their life before. They were on fire to believe for him, to do his will in his way. And God is here telling you today that you are ready to be lit. You are ready to be on fire. You are ready to be encouraged. That that ministry that you've been called for, that whisper in your ear that has been God, is ready to call you out to conquer some land, to take your promise, to be some giants. So I encourage you today, give it to God and go out and win a battle. Amen. Wanted to add to that last analogy where we talked about changing the environment. And I heard this uh, sermon, I believe Chris Valentin did it the other day, and he talked about, uh, um, you know, if I took a boiling pot of water and I stuck it in the refrigerator, uh, which one would which one would win? Which environment would would win? And uh, they said, "Well, of course, the refrigerator would." But if I took a that same boiling pot of water and let's say I put a little burner underneath of it, and I stuck it inside the refrigerator and I plugged that in, they would com com be, combat against each other. But if I took that same bowl of water and I put it in the refrigerator and I had that plugged in and I unplugged the refrigerator, which one would win? The whole point of that whole saying is, is wherever you're plugged in, whatever your source is, wherever your power comes from, is the environment that's going to win. So, and, and he was using as an analogy of saying that as we come into the church and we can be set on fire, we can be passionate, we can be burning, and we go out there and be completely ineffective because we're not plugging in when we're leaving. We're, we're, not, we're not understanding that we have to be we have to continue to do our prayer. We have to continue to read. We have to continue to have to be plugged in outside of this environment other than just coming here on Sundays. It's a big important thing that we understand where our source is and where it comes from. Amen? Thank you, Mr. Payne. Appreciate that. We have soup. We have a soup fellowship. Please stay. We got so much soup. We got some amazing, amazing cooks in here. We got some good desserts. Y'all can come and enjoy and hang out with the crazy people here. Amen? All right. Dear Lord, have your way. Change our hearts. Make us be effective out there. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.